Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm joined by Dr. Alex Gardner-McTaggart, the course director of the Online and Blended Learning MA in Educational Leadership in Practice, which is delivered here at the University of Manchester. And I'm also joined by the, our deputy course director, Dr. Paul Armstrong. So I'm going to be asking Alex and Paul a series of questions about what you can expect from the course in terms of the learning aims, the outcomes and what this course can offer you as a student in terms of career progression and opportunity, should you choose to join up to study on this master's degree programme. So COVID-19 has forced many educational settings to close globally, which has really disrupted the learning of so many. So I'm also going to be asking Paul and Alex to share their thoughts on this today and what they think the future holds for educational leaders, educators and educational settings post COVID-19. So I'm going to start with a couple of introductions. So my name is Daisy James. For those of you who don't know me, I am the course advisor for this particular course, the MA in Educational Leadership in Practice here at the university. So my role essentially is to support you as prospective students to help you make that really informed decision about taking the next steps in your kind of academic career. I, like I said, am joined by Paul and Alex. So Alex, do you want to introduce yourself to our listeners today? Yeah, hi. So I've got a, a, a rather long name, Alexander Gardner McTaggart. Thanks, mum. Thanks, dad. But usually I'm referred to as Alex McTaggart. And, and I'm the course director or the program director, as we call it in Manchester, and um, on MA Educational Leadership and Practice. My particular field and interest is in international education, particularly international schools and their leadership, also global citizenship education. Um, and uh, I'll hand you over to Paul now. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Alex. Yeah, my name's uh, Dr. Paul Armstrong, um, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Manchester uh, Institute of Education. Um, and I work um, alongside Alex on the Education Leadership in, in Practice programme. Um, my research um, interest, my kind of academic background is, is in kind of school management and, and organisation. Um, and, 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 and I guess through that, uh, I'm interested in, in, in leadership as well. But I also um, have, a, have a keen interest in um, the notion of uh, practitioner research and, and teachers as as researchers um and, and and the ways in which we could support teachers and aspiring school leaders to develop a, a kind of research consciousness um and and utilize that in order to to enhance their, their practice and, and i've spent many years working on master's programs with with trainee teachers do, doing just that uh with, with other colleagues at mie some of whom you'll uh, have the pleasure of, of working with if you do decide to enroll in this program so yeah that's, that's enough about me I, I don't want to take up too much time talking about myself <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Paul. thanks Alex so um I guess could you both tell our listeners a little bit more about the MA in educational leadership and practice for those who may be thinking about pursuing this master's Alex I'll, I'll hand this over to you first yeah okay so um you know we see around the world a growing need for people who are, especially in those in-between spaces, um, you know, some people are crossing over into education, some people haven't been in it for very long, some people have been in it and formally trained in it, but haven't had any leadership training. And it's often quite difficult to get access to that kind of training when you're working around the world, or, or indeed, if you're working in places, even if you're in the UK, for example, where you don't have regular access to courses. And so that's why we put this blended course together so that people who are full-time professionals, busy with the teaching and the working and the learning, um, can, can do a master's degree at a prime UK Russell Group University with everything that goes with it and do it in your own time, in a, you know, in a time frame that suits you and works with you as you move forward and then still exit after two years with the same degree that everyone else has got if they do that kind of master's degree. So I guess that's really where we're coming from with this so I'll hand over to Paul yeah th thank you Alex and, and, and you know I think I, I, I can't really add a, a, a great deal to that I think Alex has given you a really great sort of overview there of, of the of the kind of focus of the program and the aims of the program and I, I suppose when we began to develop the program um, a, a couple of years ago that you know this is this is a pretty pretty new program really um, it, it, we're only coming to the end of our first um, our cohort we're coming to the end of it their first um, their graduation um, towards the end of this calendar year, our first cohort. So 
uh, when we when we began to develop this, I think, um, as Alex said, we, we very much saw a, a, a gap in, in in the provision, really, um, certainly in what we were providing and what we thought was available um, for, uh, as I said, for teachers and aspiring leaders um, within the educational sort of um, sphere, if you like. Um, and I think what you know what we really tried to do was, was kind of it's, it's writ large in the title of the program, really. You know, it's the educational leadership and practice. We wanted a program that would um, be a- applicable and useful and purposeful for practicing teachers and school leaders who want to develop their leadership practice. Okay, and and, and, and you know we include that that that's kind of kind of general term. You know, it, it's about leadership at all levels of the school and in all areas of of, of, of practice. So. Um, the program does cover a, a quite a wide range of different areas and different topics, um, including the kind of core issues around what, what leadership is and what it means and the different ways in which it's interpreted by different stakeholders. Um, but we also veer it into different directions as well, you know, things like educational change, educational policy, the kind of social practices of leadership. Um, and every step of the way, you know, I think we what we try to do is, is to, to enable you to link and align your learning, the kind of academic and the theoretical stuff with what's happening inside your schools, in your classrooms, in your own context. Um, and that's really key to this program. I think really that's what sort of sets it apart, sets it apart. And, you know, the, the culmination of all this learning will be a, a project towards the end of the, at the very end of the program, um, which will be uh, a project that you'll undertake in your, in your own school, which we hope will have a direct benefit on your practice in your school uh, and be a, you know another great reason to 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 enroll onto this program. It's not just about developing yourself um, as individuals and professionals. It's about what you can do for your school and your community by studying on this program. So you know we 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 very much view it in that way. So hopefully those are things that are kind of ticking boxes for you, making you think you know actually yeah this could be the kind of thing that I want to I, I want to take further and I want to explore further and I want to kind of know a little bit more about. Great, Paul, Alex, thanks for that. So you've kind of both touched on the what this course offers in terms of kind of career progression and opportunity, but could we just kind of en- elaborate on that? So what can this course really offer our students who may join us in terms of progressing in their current career or, or opportunities to come for them? Um, yeah, thanks, Daisy. So um what we often find is, you know, uh, people who are interested in this kind of a course, um, they've got a plan for life, you know, they've they've got ambition, they want to move on, uh, and they want to take on more responsibility in their organisations or move into other organisations and take on that kind of responsibility. The trouble is then, you know, how do you, how do you go to those job interviews and how do you get to those uh, spaces in, in employment where you're going to then be moving up and forward and how do you get noticed and that's what this is all about um, is how do you move your CV to the top of the pile um, how and that's what this MA does is it gives you the critical and intellectual competencies as well as the the, the solid clout of the University of Manchester it puts that behind you and puts you first forward and not in just a way that's uh, you know I for example I did a a weekend CPD on leadership, therefore I can be a leader. It's not like that. It's it's very robust. It's very thorough. It goes very deep. Um, some would even say it changes you as a person and, and, and as a professional. Uh, it builds your capacity. It, it makes more of you. It's not just an intellectual endeavor. It's also a professional one as well. So that you see this merging of the professional world and, and, and the intellectual world. You look at the people that we have in the department and we have a very good balanced mixture of practitioners who were themselves heads and principals and heads of departments aligned with some of the the greatest intellectuals and thinkers in the field in the 21st century as it stands. So all of this comes together in your CV on that degree to to push your CV to the top of the pile and gives you that opportunity then um, not just to be a sound intellectual but to be an active and uh, ambitious professional as well. Yeah, I think that's right, Alex. And I think you know the the other thing um, that this program will will, will do um, for your for your practice and your kind of prof- professionalism is it will it will it will open up new ways of thinking about what it is that you do and why you do it. And and, and I think in, in doing that, I think in, in in introducing you to a range of different ways of thinking about things like leadership and, and educational change and policy. 
um, you then go back into your into your workplaces with a kind of you know a, a, a different perspective on on what it is that's happening in those in in, in those places, and I, I think you're kind of armed with it with 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 a with a wider view, a wider lens, if you like, um, and that that allows you then to kind of develop develop your practice, um, and and learn you know and, and understand more about the ways in which your organisations work within the context of the kind of wider societal kind of winds that that that, that are blowing outside of that of that context but but very much influence what happens inside that con- context if that if, if that makes sense and i think broadening that understanding um is a, is an unbelievable um sort of means by which you can sort of develop your your kind of, your kind of intellect and your and your learning and your knowledge and your expertise and and, and i think all those things you know make a, a significant contribution then to your to your confidence um uh, and hopefully your, your willingness and motivation to, 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 to move to move into into different positions, whether that's promotion or, or, or otherwise. Great, thank you both. And I'm aware you've both contributed to a blog titled Five Five Education Myths That COVID nineteen Shatters. Could you tell our listeners more about what you talk about in this, please? I'll let Paul go first because Paul had much more to do with it than I did. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so what? It, by way of a little bit of background here, myself and Alex are part of a very well-established um, um, international research group um, at, at, that's, that's situated and based at the Institute of Education in Manchester called Critical Educational Policy. Um, it, it was formerly known as Critical Educational Policy and, and, and Leadership, and we're still very much interested in leadership. And, and, and what we do in that group, amongst other things, is we, we tend to, to, to write um, and, and publish various in various different outputs and one of the ways we do that is, is, is by blogging and so we, we, we write fairly regular blogs where we come together as a team and we think about particular issues that we think are pertinent that are topical that are happening um, currently or that we have a particular research interest in or, a, or concern with or we, we think they need, need to be troubled and, and, and one of those things was clearly um, uh, the, the, the onset of the pandemic uh, last, uh, last spring uh, globally uh, you know, we, we all saw this happening all around us. And I think, you know, we, we could see that one of the defining features of, of, of this uh, pandemic, um, in addition to, 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 the, to the terrible toll it's taken on, 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 on the health and the terrible, the terrible death rate, um, of, of course, that's paramount. But I think one of the lasting legacies of this pandemic and the, the key features is the impact that it's had on, on, on education. Um, and I think, at what, I think at one point last April, um, there were over 1.6 billion young people globally who were affected by, um, by, by this in terms of their schooling. You know, schools were closed fully or partially in over 160 uh, states and nations across the globe. Um, and I think even today, still now, nearly 12 months on, over 12% of the, of the, of the world's uh, young people are, are being you know, directly affected by this in terms of their education. So, you know, we thought it was an opportunity to have a look at some of the what we saw from as critical scholars, some of the myths that we think uh, perpetuate around around education, um, and that COVID nineteen has actually shone a light on and, and, and made uh, more explicit, I think, and, and made more obvious. And so we, we talked we talked about five of these myths. Um, uh, what one of them was this idea that teachers and, and leaders can provide uh, the solutions to children's academic failure. And, and, you know, what, what we're saying here is not that teachers and leaders don't make a difference. We know they make a difference. They make a huge difference, a significant difference to children's lives, but they, they can't do it on their own and they shouldn't be expected to do it on their own. Um, and, fa- and far too often, that's exactly what's expected of schools. There's too much pressure on them to, um, to, to provide the solutions to society's problems, you know, which are very complex and deep rooted and, 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 and they can't be compensated for by, um, by educators. Um, and so, you know, more support is needed in, in that regard and more acknowledgement of that. Um, we, we talk about school leaders being more important um, than teachers and support staff. Again, we think that's another myth that's perpetuated within the literature quite often. Again, that's not to say that school leaders aren't important. We know they're important. The research tells us how important they are, but they're not the only people who work in schools. And I think it's just, you know, showing that there, there should be a wider recognition Within the dominant discourse, particularly in policy discourse, that leadership is not the 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 the, the sort of only um, or the most important um, uh, sort of 
thing about 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 schooling and 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 i think that's a myth that, that that's certainly perpetuated you know the, the leadership is about facilitating and creating the conditions in which everybody in that school environment can thrive and, and it's only through doing that uh, that that schools and education systems can be as, as good as they as they ought to be um we also talk about the continuous surveillance um on, on schools and school systems and that's particularly pertinent in 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 the uk where we have a very kind of stringent um, inspection framework that's very, very influential and very powerful, uh, but not always very purposeful or, or, or supportive or helpful for, for school leaders and teachers and, and young people. Um, we also talk about uh, the decentralization of schooling and, and, and the dismantling of, of local government. Again, that's something we refer to in the UK context. Um, and we link that to the, this this wider notion of, of the privatisation of, of public public education, and that, that's something that our colleagues, uh, Dr. Steve Courtney, is an expert, and he's written a lot about that. And again, if you do enroll in this program, you, you'll, you'll get the chance to work with, work with Steve. And the fifth myth um, that we talk about um, is that education ought to be best understood and, and delivered around the interests of the individual. And, and again, we talk about that within this context of of privatisation, the ultimate privatisation, if you like. Uh, the privatization of the self and and, and, and this idea that, uh, um, that, that that the individual matters more than, than than the sort of collective and actually what we what we're arguing for here is that um, you know if covid has shown us anything is that we are better together working together under a sort of a, 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 within a public educational system um, that's not serving the interests of, of private sort of enterprises, but actually the interests of 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 of, of, um, of the young people within within the public public sphere and the communities that in which they live. So that's a very quick walk through um, that, um, that, that 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 blog that we did. Alex, have you got anything to add there? Oh um, no, I think I think you've covered most points. I mean, the thing I, I will add because I'm sure there'll be a few um, international school teachers here um, is that. This, this way of thinking applies very much as well, even in autonomous and private institutions. It's this idea that teachers together um, are the people who run the schools, essentially. You know, they're the ones who um, are at the coalface every day. They're the ones who, who supply edification, education, nurture, they're connected. They're the ones who have the skills to make the, the whole place work and function. And it's tapping into those strengths and encouraging them and fostering them that, that makes good educational leadership. And what COVID has shown us is that these uh, interpersonal skills and approaches are the things that they are the glue that's holding everything together at the moment, not the leaders with the big salaries or, you know, the, the business class flights or whatever. They're not holding everything together. It's the teachers who are doing it. And I think that's a big myth that's been exploded here but it's happened in in all sectors of industry we've seen it again and again you know how the key worker is now the hero essentially because suddenly the emphasis has gone back onto them again and we can see clearly now because of covid who's important brilliant thank you both it's a really insightful piece i had a read through it um the other week so i do recommend everyone checking it out um and this kind of leads me quite nicely onto the next question so obviously as we're all aware the covid19 pandemic has created kind of the largest disruption in education in history so what do you both think is going to be the biggest challenge for educators teachers children post covid i'll let paul go first Thank you, Alex. Okay, well, I mean, as it as it so happens, we have just um, finished another blog um, about this a part of this issue, I suppose. Um, and again, a lot of our blogs are very much situated in the UK context because, of course, that's where we work, and so that's what we know the most about. Um, but I think what we've talked about in, in 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 this latest blog, and it'll be published in a couple of weeks, so I'll make sure that it's it's put up on the University of Manchester website if anyone's interested. It, it, this idea that, that the school leader uh, and, and the school itself has become very much concerned with organisational management and, and, and logistics um, to the detriment of, 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 of education. Uh, and, and what we've, what we've seen, um, certainly in England and in, and in the UK, is, is that the school leader's role has become very much about sort of organising um, educational uh, uh, provision. And it's been very much about uh, ensuring that the school is a safe learning environment 
Um, it, it's been very much about ensuring things like social distancing and, and, and sanitizing and health and safety have, have, all, have, all, have become very much um, much more prominent. Um, not that they weren't important before, but they, they, they're certainly at the top of, of, of any school leader's list of priorities now. Um, they are concerned um, and, 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 and overwhelmed by, by, by the, 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 the sort of policy discourse and, and, and the, the sort of whim of, of, of governments and, and the kind of decisions that they're making in relation to, 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 to COVID-19, how schools are open, when they're open, who are they open for, how long are they, they to open for. Um, and I think all of these things have kind of culminated and detracted from you know what really should be the core purpose of, 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 of what's happening in schools and that's the sort of you know the educational um, experience of, of the young people and the sort of learning environment and I think a lot of this is probably is probably necessary but I think going forward as we start to emerge from the fog of Covid and hopefully the vaccine programs across the globe start to take effect um, we're going to have to have a much keener eye I think as, as, as school leaders on on how those schools operate um, and what they look like from a kind of organisational management perspective and somehow try to dovetail that uh, and, and make sure that's prioritised, but not to the detriment of, of, of the kind of curriculum and, and, and learning. And I suppose that does feed into what's actually been taught in schools as well um, in, in, in terms of the, of the curriculum, what do we prioritise now? Uh, what's in, what, what is it important that our, that our young people learn about? Uh, and again, that's something that's going to need to be orchestrated and 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 and. and but by, by, by school leaders and, and, and classroom practitioners like, like, like yourselves. Um, so I think there's going to be, have to be a shift in our priorities and our, and our focus, really. And I think ultimately, um, just a final point on this, I'll let Alex have, have a say, is that I think if, if there's anything that's been... Um, if there's one thing that's been amplified and, 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 and has been more light thrown on, it, thrown on it than anything else during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's the notion of, 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 of social and educational... In, in inequality um, across the globe. And I think, you know, that chasm between the rich and the poor, um, th th those that are well off and those that are worse off, uh, those that, 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 are, that are higher achieving and those that, that are not so much by the academic um, measurements that, that, we, that we use in schools. It's been, it's not just, the light's not been, not only been shone on that in, 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 a, in, a, in a more sort of intense way. I think that that chasm has widened. And I think, um, that's something that every single person who's involved in education from communities to support staff, to teachers, to leaders, to governments across the globe and policymakers are going to have to try and uh, grapple with and, 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 get, and get a handle on going forward. Yeah, um, I totally agree, Paul. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking about that now, how for, for teachers now, it's interesting through all these Zoom lessons that we have that, you know, teachers tend to see what the child brings with them into the classroom in terms of how they act and how they behave. Now we actually get an insight into their homes. We actually look into their homes and we see how things are at home. I think that's enormously interesting, um, opening up this idea of, of you know, <laughs> equity and inequity. Um, but more pointedly, I go back to Paul's second to last point where Paul is referring to how we should take this now as an initiative to rethink what we're doing and how we're moving forward. Um, a lot of my work at the moment is about the global crises and what our children are faced with, you know, in the next 50 years and how they're going to respond to the crises of, say, climate change, for example, or, you know, race inequality, um, you know, the, the truth crisis that's happening, you know, developing critical competency so that you know as a kid, when you're reading something on a website, is it true or is it conspiracy gossip or is it, you know, what is it? These are all massive, massive issues, societal issues that are forming the future citizens of tomorrow. COVID has shown us that it's not that difficult to turn the world's economy on its head, to change everything radically and very quickly. And all this rhetoric that we've heard for, for decades and decades about, oh, no, be very careful. Every tiny wee little percentage counts and you can't do it. Well, it's all turned out to be a load of rubbish, hasn't it? <laughs> of course we can change everything. It's just will. It's just people that make that difference. And that has then highlighted again how important democratic processes are. But they're no good without citizens who don't know what they're doing. And the trouble is, at the moment, it looks very much like we've got billions of citizens out there who have gone through education, come out the other end, they're able to read and write quite well, but they have no idea what anything means. 
right? So it's a very difficult situation we're in. So I think for me, that's the big, big challenge for educational leadership moving forward is, is how can, can those educational leaders who are meaningful, important people in the lives of children, I mean, we all can think back of our schools and think how important our, you know, teachers and, and headmasters and headmistresses were to us when we grew up, you know, they left them lasting impressions on us all, some good, some bad, but um, what can we do in the future to help the world be a better place, you know, to make it a more just place? And these kind of issues, I think, for me, have really, really come out uh, due to COVID. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex and Paul. That's great. So one final question from me, um, and we're going to go back to the course itself now. So we mentioned that this course, the MA in Educational Leadership in Practice, is an online part-time blended course. Can we kind of provide our listeners and can you explain a little bit more about what that means in terms of the way this course is taught? Yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take this one first, if you don't mind, Paul. No, please do. An operational one. Um, so the course is, is blended, which as most of you will know now, I mean, we all do blended at the moment, don't we, because of COVID. Um, but there's a big difference between face-to-face, -face, online and blended. They're three distinct modalities of teaching. Uh, what's happened, um, you know, most face-to-face most -face teaching in the last year, year and a half has been hijacked and converted into online. And it's kind of really, really unfair because to put together a blended programme takes a lot of work um, it's not something you can do in three weeks but a lot of leadership has expected everyone to be able to do that in three weeks and they've done it which is remarkable but this course has been designed from the very outset to be a mixture of face-to-face -face components and online learning so what we do is we we make sure that no matter where you are in the world that you have access to us so one of the big um, complaints about, you know, distance learning is that you never meet any of the academics, you never talk to them, you never get to interact with them or be with them. And as we all know, it's very important to get to know people, to, to talk to them, to, to, you know, have a coffee with them and chat with them about ideas that you have. So this is why we have four three-day conferences throughout the two-year course where our flying faculty come to you, uh, to the centre where you are. Uh, and if you're in Manchester, obviously, you come to Manchester if you're in the UK and, and over those three day conferences, you get to meet the different academics, you get to interact with them, you get to have this uh, very intensive three day kind of conference. And then that, then you go away and then you have another semester all to yourself where you are then working at your own pace in your own time through our uh, learning platform. We use Blackboard and we also use Pebblepad, um, but it's not just a, a black, Board that's kind of been you know shoved and put together it's been carefully and deliberately crafted over a long time with lots and lots of very helpful things like purpose-built lectures for you which are only in this course here they've been made for the course the whole program has been written from a new so it's not a recycling of other bits of courses this course is new and it's in response to the challenges of the 21st century. It is actually uh, unique in that way. It has several components in it that you won't find in other courses. I mean, the most notable one is that usually when you do an MA, it'll be called something like MA Ed Leadership and Management or MA Administration and Management or something like that. This one is called purposely a uh, Master of Arts of Educational Leadership in Practice. So it's about leadership. It's not about managing, it's not about administering. You don't learn how to run a meeting. You don't learn how to fill out um, a budget sheet, which are all administrative tasks. And people often mistake these things for leadership, right? This is about developing intellectual capacity. It's about building you. It's about you being able to step into those big, top heavy, high level conversations with all the big players and hold your own and have confidence because of what you know and how you can talk about it and how you can argue and how you can field your own intellectualism. And that develops, most of this develops through the, the um, online uh, course where you're looked after by Paul, myself and the other academics. And we're very responsive to you. We make sure that um, we get back to you as soon as you, know, if you write us an email, we're usually back to you within 24 hours. Um, we have online discussion boards there where we encourage you to contribute. And of course, we go through the, the relevant readings um, that you might, uh, that 
that, that, are, that you need for the course and um, the theory behind it, the research that's been done. So it's this balance between this blackboard section um, along with Pebblepad and then the face-to-face -face conferences. And um, if you're in England or in, in Britain and you can make it to Manchester, then the, you actually come to the university, to the campus for that. And if you're in one of our regional centers, for example, Shanghai or Dubai at the moment, then you would go there and we would come to you. Now, there's, there's proper thinking behind this because it's no good to anyone or the world if we have 200 people flying into Manchester four times a year for conferences. I mean, alone the carbon footprint is ridiculous and the planet can't take much more of that. So this is a much more sustainable idea where we come to you instead. And it also means that it's easier for your planning. We know that your teachers and teacher leaders, we know that it's difficult to get away for that amount of time. Although for some people, of course, it'd be a welcome uh, step to take. Um, but, but that's essentially the concept behind it. I'm sure Paul's got something to add as well. I just unmute myself. Yeah, I'll be brief because I know that we're, 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 we're kind of um, running out of time now, Daisy. So, uh, yeah, just, just to supplement what, what Alex has said, really, I think, you know, we, we, we've got a, a long um, experience of working with practitioners and professionals doing uh, postgraduate study uh, in addition to holding down full time jobs and, and, and busy lives. And so I think we're very receptive to that, as Alex said, and we'll sort of bend and flex and work with you. Um, to ensure that you can complete your studies to the best of your ability and, and flourish and, and, and achieve the kind of um, outcomes that you expect and that you, that you desire. Um, um, you know, we, we're very adept at doing that. And we've, 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 we've designed the program around that. We've designed it around individuals like yourselves. Um, and so, and, and, you know, again, as, as Alex said, we're, we're, we're very aware of, of, of how challenging it is to undertake um, postgraduate study in a, in a, in a part-time capacity and you know and so we, we we've designed a program to to make that as smooth as as possible we we can't write your assignments for you and we can't complete the degree for you sadly um sadly for you i should say not for us uh but we can put in place conditions that will enable you to to do that for yourselves um and do that in a way that's fulfilling and, 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 and enjoyable um and will allow you to 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 go on to uh, to achieve what what you want to achieve, and we think that this program will will, will play a huge huge part in 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 those sort of aspirations. So, yeah, um, hopefully we'll get the chance to meet um, some of you in person um, over the uh, you know in, in the not too too distant future. Brilliant. Paul, Alex, thank you so much for today. It's, it's been really informational and insightful. And I think um, one last point for, from me before we wrap up and end today. Um, I kind of act, as I mentioned, as your course advisor, so I can really support you in the early stages of kind of making a decision about next steps. So please do get in touch with me. I'll share this recording around to you all so you've got my email address, but please get in touch with me, have a Zoom conversation with me to discuss kind of the course in a more detail, but also it helps me to kind of understand your background. So I'm better placed to advise you on, on how to take those next steps. So um, Alex and Paul, again, thank you so much for today. And from all of us from the University of Manchester, we hope we can meet some of you very soon um, and we hope that you join, join this fantastic programme. Thank you, Daisy. Bye, Thank everyone. You, Daisy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cool. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.